I don't have a clue what's going on. Please, someone explain in a way even I can understand. What happened yesterday? I was in the kitchen of the mansion, grabbing some food without permission. If you open up that massive business class refrigerator, you can find anything. You can eat and drink as much as you like. Even if the typhoon didn't clear up for a week, I'd have more than enough to eat. With wine in one hand, I was helping myself to some dry cured ham. I wonder just how expensive this wine and ham are. View ingredients are out of luck too. If only you had had Goda-san to cook you, you could have been reborn as much more incredible food. I looked at the clock. Very soon, it would be 12 a.m. October 5th, the second day, would end. The insane October 4th, yesterday, seemed like a lie. That's how much... Nothing had happened after that test thing. Nothing happened. No phone call came, and no letters came. No person came and no one attacked me. Nothing happened at all. I want to start demanding a refund on all the time and energy that Tension stole from me. Because after that, for an entire day, a full 24 hours, Nothing happened. So surely, nothing's gonna happen now. A full 24 hours ago, Beatrice called me to the spot in front of the mansion's entrance. There, I was given a strange test to determine the successor to the headship or whatever. I gave a serious answer in my own way, but that somehow hadn't meshed with the other side. Beatrice got pissed for no reason and fell silent. I yelled at her to try and say something, but she gave no answer. When I asked where Maria was, she just told me to go to the chapel at left. To tell the truth, it was an anticlimax. No matter what kind of weird test you give, at least tell me whether I have passed or failed. Are you trying to say, thanks for coming, the results will be mailed to you later or something? Quit messing with me. Anyway, I then headed to the chapel. After failing the tests, both George, Aniki and Jessica were killed. I couldn't let Maria get killed too. Also, I might get a chance to catch some person trying to kill her. As a little kid, I often heard from Jessica that you'd get in trouble if you went near the chapel. So I'd never been there, but I at least knew where it was. I couldn't find any trace of a person there. But there was a key bundle lying in front of the door. I thought this might be someone telling me to open the door, but after trying all the keys, I found that none of them fit. I also called Maria's name, but there was no answer whatsoever. I searched around the chapel, but there was a limit to what I could do in the pitch black with just a flashlight. I realized that this key bundle might be a set of master keys, which could make it possible to open the door to the mansion. I found no sign of Maria, so I returned to the mansion. The mansion was wrapped in silence, and in a horrible stench. However, it's amazing how good humans are at adapting. The inside of the mansion must still be wrapped up in that smell. However, I grew completely used to it and stopped minding it. It didn't seem any worse than any old house where someone had burnt some meat. At first, I was bewildered by the stench, but I decided to head to the dining hall for the time being. and found those corpses that were so pitiful, Goda-san and the rest had hesitated to speak of them in detail. It was the remains of Aunt Natsuhi, 
and the others who had become the first victims. Half of each head had been completely split open, and it was so gruesome that even without knowing a thing about examining corpses, I could say that they were a hundred percent dead. And on top of that, the remaining halves of their faces were left like normal, so it was even easy to identify them. Really convenient corpses these were. And in addition to those six bodies, was one more. The seventh corpse was Maria. She lay next to Aunt Rosa, as though sleeping alongside her. I cried. At the death of an innocent young girl. And at the cruel way my dad and the rest had died. I raced through the mansion, swinging the headstand spear, yelling, come out here, bastard. But I couldn't find any trace of anyone else. Thinking they might be planning to hide somewhere and attack me from behind, I went around searching for hiding places, sometimes growing more cautious, and sometimes intentionally letting my guard down in various ways, but in the end, not even a kitten appeared. Then, morning came. My tension and fatigue combined with my drowsiness, making for the worst kind of dawn. Humans are pretty incredible. Even when a murderer might be hiding somewhere, we prioritize drowsiness and fatigue over our own lives. By that time, I was starting to feel pretty ridiculous. After all, for full six hours before dawn, I'd walked around the mansion yelling at the culprits to show themselves. My search had been a careful one, and I tried myself out and let my guard down. Even so, no one came to attack me. Basically, I lost patience with them and figured they could do whatever the hell they wanted. The boat won't come until the typhoon passes. They said on TV that it won't pass until tomorrow, so I've got another full day today. Lazing about lost its interest, and even though I knew it would probably make the police mad, I decided to play detective a bit. First was the dining hall, where the very first murder had occurred. The six who had been killed in the beginning really were pitiful. The weapon used was probably a gun. Maybe their heads were split by something powerful, like a magnum bullet or a shotgun. It was a reasonable theory to hold. Compared to that, the seventh corpse, Maria, had died in a much better and cleaner way. At a glance, I could see no external wounds and didn't understand how she'd been killed. But by her mouth were traces of bubbles that she might have spat out. And it looked like a typical death by poisoning that you might see in a TV drama. Wasn't Maria called out to the chapel and given a test? So why was she in the corpse-filled dining hall, lying next to her mother, dead? Even if the cause of death was poison, who gave it to her? Her clothes weren't disturbed at all. It's hard to imagine that she was forcibly pushed down and given an injection of poison. It's probably better to assume that she was given a capsule of poison, or something, and made to swallow it. But compared to the scattered and violently mutilated corpses in this room, Maria's corpse was too clean. If they had a gun, they only needed to pull the trigger. But poisoning, whether by having her drink it or by an injection, would take a lot more effort. Considering the culprit's brutal nature, you'd think Maria's death alone was given special treatment. Why was only Maria given a sleep-like death? True, being killed is always a pitiful thing, but for some reason, Maria's death alone seemed very courteous to me. Both of Maria's hands were joined on her chest, as though the dead person had put them there himself. Did Maria do that herself before dying? Isn't this usually something done by someone else after the person dies? As though sleeping with her mother, whose head was half crushed, 
Maria dozed in peace. For some reason, that contrast really bugged me. Including the direct cause, it's probably safe to say that Maria's death is shrouded in mystery. And more than anything else, the biggest mystery of this dining hall was the pitfalls. The pitfalls that both Uncle Krauss's group and Goda's son had mentioned. After the first six were killed, five more fell through pitfalls and were captured. What are pitfalls? Those things that suddenly open and you fall through them, right? The room had a solid floor with a carpet that looked dignified, if a bit worn out. No matter how you looked at it, it was a single piece. If a pitfall had opened up, there would have to, there would have to be a seam just in that place. And if there had been some trick like a pitfall, wouldn't it creak when you walked on it? No matter how much I walked around, feeling the carpet, I just couldn't imagine that a pitfall was hidden there. Anyway, it would be more than thing if a single person fell, but the full five people did. By putting together everyone's stories, each one of them had fallen from a different location. So at the very least, there had to be five separate places with pitfalls. So what does this mean? Was this room actually made with pitfalls across the entire floor? So by pushing a button, you could open up a pitfall in the location of your choice. Some kind of contraption like that? That kind of ridiculous mechanism would be surprising, even in a ninja mansion. But if Dad and the rest had heard about this, I wonder if they'd say, I wouldn't put it past Grandfather to do it, to make it. At any rate, I didn't learn anything more from the dining hall. Do the pitfalls not exist? Or do they exist, but I just can't find them, amateur that I am? I can't say for sure. Since they claimed that the pitfalls were there, I can't ignore them, even if I can't find them. The next ones to be killed were Jessica and George Aniki. I discovered George Aniki when I had been called out for my test. He had been called out to the arbor in the Rose Garden, and probably shot in the forehead with a gun. Jessica had been called to her own room on the second floor of the mansion. The door to her room was locked. But that wasn't a problem at all since I had a master key. Inside the room, it was horrible. But after the dining hall, I was used to corpses, so I'd built up a bit of an immunity. The phone receiver was loose and dangling. Had she been killed while still on the phone with me? Jessica was leaning against the wall right next to it, with half of her head split open. As far as I could tell by glancing at the scene, it looked as though she'd been killed while on the phone. In that case, had the culprit been right there before her eyes? I hadn't gotten that impression when listening to Jessica's voice over the phone. I'm pretty sure Jessica said, they got me. It's probably best to assume that she'd already received a fatal wound at the time of the phone call. That's right, and she also said this. Yes, that's what she said. From what I could tell by looking at Jessica's corpse, there were no wounds on her other than the damage to her head. Could she have had an injury serious enough to make her prepared for death and then died halfway through the phone call? But the way she talked on the phone made me think that she'd escaped harm for the time being. You shouldn't be able to have a casual conversation over a phone if the culprit's right before your eyes. So, did the culprit come in partway through the phone call and kill Jessica? No, that can't be right. After all, this room is locked. Wait, that doesn't tell me anything. If the culprit stole a master key from one of the victims, locking the door would be meaningless. 
but she had no external wounds other than her head. In that case, should I assume that the fatal wound she was prepared to die from and the actual external wound that damaged the head were two different things, and that both of them were made to the same part of the body? In other words, Jessica was struck severely to the head and received an incredibly bad wound. Then she called me and either lost consciousness or died while on the phone. Then the culprit came and damaged her head again, something like that. After being called to this room, Jessica was attacked by the culprit and received a serious injury. Then the culprit thought she'd been killed and went away for the time being. But Jessica miraculously started breathing again and called me with, the, with what would become her dying message. Then the culprit realized that they'd failed to kill her and rushed back to deliver the final blow after Jessica fell unconscious from massive blood loss. That seems to add up, more or less. Except for how Jessica was able to accurately predict the nature of the final blow. And there was one more thing that bugged me about the phone call from Jessica. Jessica had said this. <laughs> She said it almost as though she'd witnessed George Aniki being killed. But while you certainly could see the rose garden from the window in Jessica's room, and you could even see the roof of the arbor where George Aniki had been summoned, it was very far away. Add on the fact that it was the night of a typhoon, and it's very hard to imagine that she was able to witness everything that happened by the arbor from this window. And more than anything else, Jessica left before George Aniki. So she shouldn't have known that George Aniki's test took place by the arbor. Why did Jessica know that George Aniki had been killed? Also, during my search of the entire mansion, I found Kiryu-san's corpse as well. It was in one of the old guest rooms at the back of the first floor. In the past, before the construction of the guest house, the relatives had spent the night in these. Kiryu-san's situation matched Jessica's perfectly. She'd probably been killed during her phone call with me. The receiver was hanging untidily, and Kiryu-san lay crumpled in that corner. But the way she had been killed was very different from Jessica. Her head wasn't smashed. Instead, a stake with an occult design was buried into her forehead. It was so gruesome, so I pulled it out. After pulling it, I realized that this might get me into trouble with the police later. So, a little too late, I set it down by Kiryu-san's side. Its tip was sharp and stained with enough blood that it must have penetrated fully to the brain. I didn't know what kind of metal it was made of, but it was about as heavy as a paperweight. Certainly, if it were stabbed all out with something like this, it might cause a terrible wound. I probably knew what that stake meant. It's one of those. The style of killing from the fourth twilight onwards in the witch's epitaph. It's probably that gouge with a stake and kill thing. However, a human skull is very firm. No matter how much someone mustered their strength, could it really have been pierced so neatly? No. By my reasoning, this stake wasn't the cause of death, but had just been used to damage the corpse after death. She was probably killed with a gun or something, like George Aniki and the stake had been stuck into the hole left by the gun. Thinking of it that way makes it easier to accept. But was Kiryu-san really killed with a gun? As she said on the phone, even though she was holed up inside a locked room, Kiryu-san was being attacked. In fact, this room had been locked. Also, 
She mentioned a golden thread or something flying in and attacking her. In fact, there were four places around Kirisan's corpse with holes that could have been caused by some kind of attack. But a golden thread attacked her through the keyhole? I looked at the door from Kirisan's perspective. If it had been one of those old keyholes you see in old mystery movies, where you can peek through to the other side, then it would have clearly been possible to stick something through it. But even though the doors in this mansion were old fashioned, the locks were the familiar average cylinder style that you could find in any normal house. In other words, they weren't constructed in a way that would let you penetrate through them. So no matter how thin an object you might try to stick through the keyhole, it's unthinkable that something penetrated through from the outside and attacked. A cylinder lock. And a keyhole? But despite that, Kirisan definitely said something like a golden thread had flown in through the keyhole, spun around while aiming for her, and attacked her. A golden thread attacking through a keyhole. I couldn't understand what it meant at all. But, even so, Kirisan probably predicted that I wouldn't be able to understand all this. And it wasn't just Kirisan. Jessica said it over the phone too. No, since the very beginning, from the time we talked with Godasan and Kumasawa-san and got the phone call from Uncle Krause's group, everyone has said the same consistent thing. Grandfather summoned witches and demons and is killing people with magic. They'd been shown that right before their eyes. These weren't tricks or fakes. There was no choice but to believe it. With one voice, they had all said that.